So today we are um, proceeding with uh, strengthening mechanisms. We know from um, last couple of lectures that, that iron is actually very soft material and that in um, most applications, if not all, um, strengthening is required. And uh, we, uh, we basically um, increase the strength in steels by um, accumulating dislocations. And it's basically done by having obstacles in the way of the gliding dislocations. So we'll try to understand how we, uh, how we do this. We, we increase the strength by introducing lattice defects, uh, alloying elements, grain boundaries, dislocation, other dislocation precipitates. Uh, and those are basically the main uh, strengthening mechanisms and they all act as obstacles. And we'll, we'll see if we can uh, actually calculate some, uh, the size of the strengthening effect for specific cases in steels. And that will uh, basically tell us, well, you, you need to engineer the microstructure if you want to uh, make use of a particular um, strengthening mechanism in a particular application. Right, and so we already know uh, from uh, earlier lectures that we, um, uh, we can use solute atoms, uh, atoms as strengthening mechanism, dislocations, grain boundaries, precipitates. We can also use uh, multi-phase microstructures uh, and we can do, also do what's called structure strengthening in steels to achieve strengthening. Uh, so with solute atoms, we can have immobile obstacles. The solutes can act as immobile obstacles. Uh, for instance, uh, substitutional atoms are usually immobile. Or we can have mobile uh, solute atoms. Uh, some, at some conditions, uh, you can have solute interstitial atoms which are mobile at the temperature where you want to achieve the strengthening. This locations, um, uh, of course, in all steels, you apply this by just straining the material. The grain boundary strengthening is achieved by controlling the grain size. Precipitation hardening in steels uh, is usually achieved with hard particles, hard carbides or nitrides. Um, there's some very specific cases where we use soft particles and that's the case when we use copper solute uh, uh, hardening. Uh, and uh, some copper added steel when we would form very soft, softer copper uh, particles in the steel. And we'll discuss some of this in a moment. Multi-phase microstructure, we, we basically have more than one phase. Right? And actually many steels are in this uh, situation. Uh, for instance, the, the, the simplest uh, uh, constructional steels are ferrite perlite steels and um, so we we have two phases we have ferrite and an additional amount a volume fraction of, of uh, cementite carbide and you'll see that this uh, can give me appreciable strengthening uh, when we talk about structure uh, strengthening um, we generally refer to uh, other processes than a second phase. We uh, refer to processes where a second phase is, uh, is created, for instance, uh, from uh, Martensitic transformations. And that can be, in particular, through straining, you can uh, have uh, the structure partially transformed into Martensite, and that gives you structural strengthening. You can do that in single phase steels, for instance, stainless steels, or you can do this in this martensitic transfer in multi phase steel. And then, and, and then we, we generally talk about low carbon trip steels. In addition, there is a process of deformation twinning, 
where you don't really get a, a, uh, uh, another phase, but you get the same phase with a different crystallographic orientation that also uh, results in strengthening. Now, um, the interactions between dislocations and obstacles um, can be very diverse. Hmm? Uh, you can have obstacles which are weak or strong. So you have this, you can have a, on this diagram here, you can have uh, the strength of the interaction, as it were. Yes. Um, and the interaction can be also um, very localized, yes, or very diffuse, yes. And um, so uh, let's just uh, give uh, an example here. Um, if you have strong obstacles, yes, which are um, very localized, yes, the, uh, the dislocations will act as these strong pinning points, yes. And this is, for instance, what you see uh, when you have in a, in a steel, you have a um, carbides or nitrides in the microstructure. You'll have, you'll have strong obstacles, which gives you a very local point-like interaction. But it doesn't have to be this way. Yes? There are interactions which are, for instance, non-local yes? interaction, diffuse interaction, and where the, uh, the obstacles are relatively weak. In that case, the dislocation kind of is influenced by uh, these obstacles in, the, in a non-local way. Hmm? Hmm? For instance, uh, when it moves, it will, it will jump over a number of these obstacles and it will uh, position itself in a low energy position somewhere in the uh, influence field of these these obstacles. Hmm? Um, and we also have obstacles, uh, as I, I told you, which can be uh, uh, immobile or mobile. Hmm? In the case of mobile uh, defects, the dislocation will move to a position, hmm? and then uh, the, the obstacles will move to that position uh, where the dislocation is arrested. Um, in many cases, the, um, the dislocations don't move in a continuous fashion. They, they move in a fashion where uh, they will move for a moment and then stop, wait at obstacles till stress levels have increased and then break away from, this, uh, from these obstacles. Yes? So you have a, we call this motion a jerky motion. Yeah? So, and that, the, 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 um, the existence of this jerky motion makes it possible for point defects to catch up, as it were, with the dislocations. Hmm? And that gives rise to um, mechanical uh, effects such as dynamic strain aging. Hmm? Okay, so, but the reason why I'm introducing this is uh, we, will, we will not go into this but it's, it's important for you to realize that um, depending on the situation you have, the, the theory of uh, hardening, the theory of strengthening may be different. For instance, it, um, obviously you can see here that the density of obstacles has to play a role in some way or another, right? But the, um, the dependence on the concentration of the strengthening effect may be different depending on how the interaction, uh, what the interaction between the obstacle and the dislocation is. Hmm? So um, we'll see in a moment that the, in particular with solute solution strengthening, the theories, uh, there are many theories uh, available on the effect of uh, relating the strengthening to the concentration of the uh, dialoying elements. And uh, it pretty much depends on what you think is the interaction uh, to give you the, uh, the result, the, the relation between the strengthening and the, uh, the concentration. You'll see that in a moment how this proceeds. So anyway, very important again, and I, I never stress this enough, 
um, you know, pure iron, very pure iron, you know, no carbon or anything. The, the, uh, the strength levels that you measure are very low. Hmm? So if you, the, the, if you look at the, sh the critical result shear stress, you're, you're just a little bit below 20 megapascal. And so if you calculate this into a tensile stress, uh, you're looking at 30 to 40 megapascal. So it's not very, not very much. It, very quickly, as soon as you add some alloying elements, you know, for instance, carbon, the, the, uh, you, you see this uh, result shear stress increasing, and, and that is, of course, strengthening, a uh, reflection of the, the strengthening effect. Hmm? So um, what, what is the interaction? Hmm? So if we, um, if, if we look at the general obstacle, the general obstacle, what, how does an obstacle work in general? Hmm? Well, you, you could think of it as a, an obstacle uh, being a, a potential well, if you want. Hmm? And so the, um, uh, the dislocation will be when it uh, goes towards the obstacle, it, it is attracted to this potential well, yes? And then, um, and then to take it out of the potential well, you need to apply a force, yes? You need to increase the force. So it, the dislocation uh, is attracted to the obstacle and then you, you need some force to break it away from the obstacle. That's basically what an obstacle uh, does. It has a certain pinning effect on the dislocations. Hmm? And you can go, uh, I, this, the theory I'm going to uh, uh, discuss uh, this morning, you. You know, please don't, don't go too much into it as you review the, the material is not necessary because we're, we're basically, um, as I said, uh, you know, talking about steel and technology, but you, the, the number of things you, uh, you may be interested in where these uh, equations uh, come from. But basically, um, uh, one of the, the, the basic um, equations that allows you to um, determine this uh, interaction force here. Hmm? That's the force that the uh, uh, the uh, obstacles exert on the uh, this location. So if, you, if I have an obstacle here, yes, the right. Uh, the dislocation here has been attracted by the obstacle, yes? And, and then I just basically need to increase the stress to uh, remove it, yeah? to, 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 to make it break loose. So there is certain uh, force that I apply uh, that, that the, um, the particle exerts on the dislocation. And the dislocation itself exerts a, uh, a force too when it wants to, yeah? And the, the way we, um, we express this is by making use of the uh, line tension of the, uh, the dislocation. So these, these two bits of, uh, of dislocation here exert a pulling action. Hmm? Right. And uh, this pulling action uh, is, uh, comes from the, the applied uh, stress. So the applied stress here yes, uh, will give me not T, because T is a constant, but the angle that T makes. So if I have a weak, uh, a, a weak uh, obstacle, the dislocation will be break free yes, when so this is a weak, will break free, for instance, at this, in this case, right? This location has broken free, right? Uh, when um, this uh, angle here, this angle uh, theta, is very large, yes? It's large, yeah? If I have a very strong, uh, very strong uh, obstacle, then it will take me a lot more Yes, it'll take me a lot more force to pass this obstacle. Yes, so this is much larger. And in this extreme case, yes, uh, 
the angle here, theta, yes, is zero, yes. So the line tension doesn't vary, it's this angle that varies, okay? So, I'll just, let's redo the, so if, if T is like this, T, T, the sum of these T is, so this is, if I have breakaway in this condition, yes, then the, the uh, retaining force is small, F is small, and if I have a situation, oops, let me redraw this, situation where breakaway or depending occurs in this condition, yes, you can see F is much larger. Yeah? The T value is the same, but the angle, so the, the, the breakaway angle is important here. Yeah? Okay, and, th and this is the relation here, hmm? the, the general relation. Hmm? Okay. All right. Okay. So we can uh, we can study this. Hmm? So this location arriving at a, uh, a group of obstacles yeah, and passing through them by uh, depending from pinning points. Yes, like here, for instance, this. Uh, I have depending here, and the dislocation will move till it hits the next uh, obstacle. Hmm? Um, right, so the, the average uh, area per obstacle, yes, is, uh, well, it's, it's, it's here, of course, I have a very simple geometry. I will have one obstacle per square plus per, per square area here. So that's L effective, the effective distance between these obstacles. Hmm? All right, and we'll come back to that in a moment. So uh, what can these obstacles be? Hmm? They can be, up to now, they can be anything. I just I really didn't say what it was. Uh, and, and also for you, it's really important to think of obstacles. Obstacles are not pinning points. They're like places where the dislocation is held up and if the force increases, it, the, the dislocation is a pop, pop away from this obstacle, right? Hmm? It's not like a hard pin, you know, where the dislocation gets tangled and it never moves, you know, it can only, it has to move around. There are some cases where that happens, yeah? But for instance, the typical examples where um, dislocation gets held, get held up are by, by solutes. Hmm? The solutes, um, uh, and so we have solutes such as substitutional elements, mm, elements such as uh, silicon or phosphorus who are smaller than iron, and elements such as manganese, titanium, niobium, etc., who, ha who, who can have various shapes which are different from iron but larger in general. Mm. And then I have these uh, interstitial elements, interstitial elements that are present in uh, octahedral or tetrahedral positions, usually we know in uh, octahedral positions. In ferrite, they have room in these octahedral positions, but not enough room, so they always will stretch the, the, the lattice around them. Hmm? And so two things happen uh, when, when you insert a, an alloying element, is that I will have a change in the lattice parameter, hmm? so the lattice parameter will change, not necessarily increase, yes, it may decrease. Hmm? Uh, for instance, when you add silicon or phosphorus, you, add, you basically add elements that are smaller. Yes? So that you don't, and, and when you add an element such as molybdenum, you have a very big element. So, um, so the, 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 the lattice, local lattice distortion may be positive or negative. But the important thing is they cause lattice, local lattice distortion. The other thing they do is because they have different um, electronic properties, yes, they will also influence the local uh, modulus. So basically, uh, the modulus will change locally. What does that mean? It means that the lattice can become locally harder or locally softer. And that's, those are basically the, the, the two main effects, yes? 
And of these two, the, uh, the, uh, the distortion, the lattice distortion, is the most important one. Hmm? Now, uh, when, when we look at these uh, solutes, yes, this, the lattice distortion around the solute can be pure dilatation, so either pure dilatation or uh, where, where the, the lattice is pushed away around the alloying element, but it doesn't have to be. Hmm? And in particular elements such as uh, um, carbon and nitrogen, they distort the lattice in an asymmetric way. Yes? They, it's, so instead of having a, 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 strain, a strained volume, hmm? uh, um, uh, uh, a strain that's spherical, you have a strain that's, that looks more like a, an ellipsoid. Hmm? Okay. Okay. When we insert uh, an atom in the lattice, the very complex electronic effects happen. But you can also look at it from a purely mechanical point of view and say if you insert molybdenum, which is a very large atom, into uh, iron lattice, the uh, molybdenum will be in compression, so will will undergo hydrostatic stresses, yes, and around the, uh, the, uh, the, the matrix around it will also be in compression, yes, but this compression will be, uh, will decay radially. Hmm? So eventually if you go far away from this molybdenum atom, you will have decay of this hydrostatic uh, uh, compression. Hmm? And, and this field decays as 1 over r to the uh, minus 3. Hmm? Okay. And that's basically what happens, is as the uh, dislocations move, yes, they are surrounded by their stress and strain field, yes? And they come in the vicinity of solute atoms, yes? With their own stress and strain field, yes? And these will interact. That's basically this, uh, this mechanical interaction that will, uh, will cause the, um, the hardening effect of a solute on the moving dislocation. Hmm? All right. So, one of the simple ways, yeah, um, in which you can look at this, I, I, I just want to go back here. Uh, if you look at this, yeah, uh, you, you can immediately see that this will be a complex problem, even if we simplify it very much, you know, because. Obviously, the interaction between your dislocation and your atom will depend on the position of the atom. And the interaction uh, between this atom and this dislocation on their glide plane will be different from the interaction between the same dislocation and the same atom, but the, the atom being above or below the glide plane. Yeah, so these uh, theories take into take this into account. Uh, but if you look at things in a very simple manner, you just say, well, okay, I'm just concerned about the dislocation and what's going on in their glide plane, yes? You find that the, uh, the stress, yes? The, the um, additional stress, as it were, uh, required to move the dislocation through uh, a, a plane which contains a, uh, a certain density of uh, solute atom goes at, with the square root of the uh, the content, the uh, the concentration of the atoms, square root. Um, uh, yes, because. Um, so if you go through the, the very simple theory, 
the uh, moment where you do where you have the breakaway and if the retaining force is F you have that tau times B is F over L where L is this uh, the distance between the uh, the particles you can uh, calculate what L effective is and it it goes as one L effective square goes as one over the area density of the uh, obstacles or of the uh, the atoms here and if you plug this into this you find that the the strengthening effect goes as a square root of the uh, concentration so that's that's a good thing yeah and uh, obviously if I uh, go back you can also see that the strengthening effect is influenced by this F value hmm? the F value how strong is the interaction yeah. and obviously what uh, what you can see or what you can uh, 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 one of the first thing you can look at is well uh, what is the effect of the the size of the particle you know, do, do larger particles have more strengthening or what and you can see here that um, as a function of the Z, the atomic number of the alloying element, you, you have uh, alloying um, atom diameters which are slightly uh, lower than that of iron and slightly higher than that of iron. It's important that this, uh, this solid solution strengthening, as we call it, is uh, it's taken into account uh, you take into account the fact that uh, if, if there is a very, very large difference in atomic size, the atoms usually don't stay into solid solution but form precipitates. Hmm? Okay. And, uh, and, and what we do see is also is that uh, uh, so, so as the Z increases, the lattice, uh, the size of the atoms increase and the the misfit percentage increases, obviously. The, if you look at the elements, the main strengthening elements in, uh, in steels, in ferrite, ferritic steels, uh, they are phosphorus, silicon, and manganese. The, the volume misfit is about minus 13 for, uh, for phosphorus percent, uh, about minus 8 for silicon, and plus 5 for manganese. And if you look at this, uh, you're not surprised to know that phosphorus is a very strong uh, solute strengthener in, in, in ferrite because of this very large uh, volume misfit. And it's very interesting to note it's a negative misfit. So people have looked at this, uh, at this misfit, yes? Um, so you can look at the atomic size, but it doesn't really tell you the effective lattice distortion that you get. The effective lattice distortion is, is measured by looking at what is the impact of that alloying element on the lattice parameter. And that's this misfit parameter delta. So delta is, uh, gives me an idea of the change of the lattice parameter of alpha with the concentration of that alloying element and I express it uh, in, in a relative uh, manner so I, one over the lattice parameter so I get a parameter that um, is not uh, uh, dimension with, without any dimensions yeah? and you see here different elements yes uh, typical values that are reported in the literature and you see indeed that for elements such as silicon, which is smaller than iron, you, instead of having a lattice expansion, you get a lattice contraction, yes? And you can see that indeed uh, this parameter here, delta, is negative. Hmm? I don't see phosphorus here in my uh, list, but... Um, and uh, you can also see that um, these are very small changes in the lattice parameter, very small changes in the lattice parameter. And, uh, and, and that there is uh, also uh, variation in, in the reported values. And uh, 
Where do these variations come from? Well, it's, you get very high purity binary uh, materials is very difficult, and that's probably one of the reasons why there is so much uh, variety. And in certain cases, such as in the case of vanadium here, you see uh, there's even a, uh, a lot of var uh, variations. Yeah. So, um, hydrostatic distortion of the lattice uh, is what uh, most uh, substitutional elements give me as, uh, uh, for the distortion. Um, a, a strengthening effect through the interaction of, that this uh, dilatation has with the uh, strain and stress field of the dislocation. And this is one of the, the, the simple um, equations of uh, the strengthening effect here, hmm? where um, the, the strengthening effect per uh, um, uh, per atomic percent of the element is given by 0.2 g times delta, g being the um, uh, uh, shear modulus and delta being given by, by this factor here, which is um, related to, to this delta, but not exactly. To the, not exactly. It's, it's uh, the, the relative difference in atomic uh, radius. And you can see here that that's actually the main effect. But there are other theories around, yes, um, where uh, which take into, the f into consideration that there is a modulus effect, so that uh, the, the modulus changes with concentration of alloying element, and the, uh, and the lattice parameter changes as a function of uh, the lattice uh, concentration of that uh, solute. But in general, what we find, most theories find is that the size effect is dominant. Yes, the, the lattice distortion is dominant. And, and here you have um, an alternative uh, equation here for the, the strengthening, uh, where the strengthening is proportional to the, uh, the size effect, this delta, and the concentration of your alloying element. And you see here that the uh, proportionality constant is not c to the, uh, the square root of c, but c to the two-thirds, yes? And so in general, uh, most theories of solid solution hardening will give you the strengthening, yes, will depend on, so will be a function of the concentration of your alloying element to a certain power, yes, uh, and the interaction strength, the interaction strength, yes, and maybe a number of other parameters such as the modulus and things like that. The, this F value is a function of the, this factor here, yes, the, the lattice distortion, and eta, which is the modulus effect. So that's where all these parameters fit in. Hmm? So strengthening is a function of concentration of your alloying element, and then the, the strength of the obstacle dislocation interaction, which is a function of the distortion and the modulus uh, effect. And, and in general, if I may go back to the, yeah, in general, this gives rise to rather um, uh, different uh, exponents in most of these theories. It turns out, however, that in practice, it's very difficult to uh, experimentally verify these theories. Um, 
you know, because you would say, well, you know, what's so difficult? You just determine uh, this, uh, this, this exponent, yes? And if you, if you know this exponent from, by changing the concentration and measuring the strengthening effect, it should also be diff easy to find, you know, F at, at, and then um, make, uh, be able to decide what theory is the correct theory. It turns out that it's not that easy because you cannot change these concentrations over large uh, concentration ranges, yes, which would allow you to do this. Yeah? So you're kind of stuck in you know, relatively small concentration ranges, and there you're not really able to say whether n is one or one half or two thirds. So the jury is still out on many of these uh, theories or application of these theories to uh, steel. And so um, in general, uh, you can use a very pragmatic approach and say, well, there's a linear relation. And that's actually as good as any. Uh, and um, most people will use these linear relations um, in alloy design. So if you want to know what's the solid solution strengthening effect of an alloy, a steel, ferritic steel that contains some phosphorus, some silicon, and some manganese, well, you, you basically find the strengthening effect of phosphorus which is 680 megapascal per mass percent. So if you know how much phosphorus has been added, say uh, if you have a, a phosphorus content of 0.01% uh, percent of, uh, of phosphorus, yes, then uh, you get uh, 6.8, yeah, you divide by 100, and you find 6.8 megapascal, yes? Um, it's also very interesting because you, you, if you see this, you say, well, if I had 1% one, 1 of phosphorus, it, I would get 680 megapascal. That's a huge amount, right, of strengthening. Uh, strengthening, 680. If you compare this to the, the basic strength of, uh, of steel, of alpha iron, which is 40 megapascal, right? So some elements have a very, very large strengthening effect. Hmm? Um, sadly enough, elements such as phosphorus and silicon uh, th that have very pronounced uh, strengthening effects cannot be used in large concentrations in steels because they have negative impacts, in particular on the toughness of the steel. They have a, a embrittled steel easily. Silicon, because it tends to form intermetallic compounds. Hmm? And, and phosphorus, because it uh, reduces the cohesive strengths of grain boundaries. So. Um, you don't add much silicon or phosphorus to, for strengthening. But there are some grades, which are called refos grades, which are uh, uh, where, where you add, say, 500 ppm of phosphorus, yes, with the idea of using st the, the solid solution strengthening effect. And silicon, you can add up to maybe half to less than 1% also for solid solution strengthening effects. Manganese, on the other hand, doesn't have these negative effects and is of also uh, often uh, used to increase the solid solution strengthening in uh, ferrite. Now, at this point, I want to, uh, a note of caution. Uh, The strengthening data that I'm showing here is strengthening data for ferrite, right? It's, it's not because an element is a strengthener in ferrite that it's also a strengthener in austenite, okay? So always, you know, if you ever use this, uh, this, this data, watch out. 
you know, uh, for what phase you're doing. So for instance, manganese in, in ferrite is 32 megapascal per mass percent. But in austenite, it is nothing, right? So in austenite, it has no strengthening effect, okay? So be careful uh, uh, using this data that it's, it's, uh, it depends on what, what phase you, you are working in. Um, so, and this brings us to another small um, aspect of, of strengthening and interaction between obstacles and dislocations. In the uh, austenitic steels, like in austenitic stainless steels, we know that the metal has a very low stacking fault energy, so we have a stacking fault. And there are interactions between stacking faults and solutes. And, and uh, there is this effect called, which you may have heard about, it's called the Suzuki effect, where solutes uh, tend to segregate to the stacking fault. And that can give also um, and uh, uh, um, a pinning effect on the dislocations. Yeah? Of course, this effect does not happen in ferritic steels where, where the stacking fault energy is very high. So this is certain, uh, some data here, yes, uh, which shows you the strengthening effect of uh, a number of elements as a function of their concentration. Uh, so you, you you see here, uh, for instance, chrome has no effect on strengthening, and silicon has a very strong one. And you see an effect both on the, the yield strength and on the tensile strength, yes? So this is what you could, you could do, which I just uh, talked about. You could just take this data and say, well, if I plot this strengthening effect in uh, just, just the same data in a log-log plot, yes? I, would, I should get a slope, and the slope should give me, you know, allow me to check uh, which theory is correct. Well, you can see here, uh, here you have a slope of uh, four-thirds, here you have a slope of one, and it, you know, the data just could fit any one of these slopes, really. So that's, uh, that's basically where we're at, is uh, we don't really know what theory is best, uh, in, usually. So, okay, so, so this, is, this is some additional effects about um, uh, uh, the effect of the lattice distortion and, and what is the effect of the uh, alloying element on the, on the modulus, on the shear modulus, but okay. Let's, let's have a look at the number of uh, um, results, experimental results. So uh, here you have, for instance, a martensitic steel, iron nickel steel. Um, and uh, so you can see that the yield strength increases with the uh, percentage of nickel and it's more or less linear if you plot it as the square root of the atomic percent of nickel. Hmm? Um, very important in particular if, is, is to make sure that when you make measurements that the substructure does not influence your data. Hmm? And martensite has a lot of uh, substructure, so if you anneal uh, this uh, martensite, you, you get nicer but different um, uh, dependence, which would tend to suggest that uh, the strengthening goes with the square root of the nickel content. Um, this is for uh, iron, uh, BCC iron with carbon, yes. You see here the yield strength plotted as a function of the carbon content, the square root of the carbon content, and there appears to be a good match. Hmm? Um, so, right? Some more data here. Uh, 
the uh, effect of uh, carbon and nitrogen on, uh, in particular, the nitrogen on FCC, uh, iron chrome manganese nitrogen alloy, you see that uh, in the case of nitrogen and FCC, uh, ferrous FCC alloys, I get a linear increase, which goes as the square root of the atomic fraction of nitrogen. And this is for uh, uh, BCC martensite uh, for carbon. And again, the data would suggest that uh, there is a good uh, relation between the increase in the stem cell strength and the square root of the atomic fraction. But in general, um, you will find very little, very little in terms of strengthening data, solid solute strengthening of, of this kind. Usually you find um, uh, data uh, either from industry or from laboratory tests, extended laboratory tests, where people have used basically steels, yes, and then obtained strengthening uh, coefficients assuming a linear relation between strengthening and the concentration of the element um, from doing uh, data analysis. Yeah? And, so, and this is shown here for substitutional elements, phosphorus. So you can see that, and this is uh, published data here, different types of steels. Um, you see, it, you, you can say, well, phosphorus is very strong solid solution hardening, but the data that you get uh, is very scattered. You, know, you have data that goes as low as 500 and as high as 1250. And the same with silicon, uh, a little bit less uh, spread in for the case of manganese, etc. So what, uh, what can you do with uh, this kind of situation? Um, the best thing to do is to you know, get the list uh, of the data, check which one, which one is good data, with the dumb uh, using the right uh, techniques and methods, um, and then use the median value, you know, if you want to um, use all of them. Don't use the mean value because then the impact of outliers like this one is too high. So median values are, are, are typically a good um, solution. Um, right, so here the, the, the um, large um, uh, effect of uh, phosphorus, silicon, and uh, manganese is, is again illustrated. With the substitutional elements, yes, the strengthening effects are, are considerable. Hmm? So you, in comparison, they, they're easily uh, 10 times higher than for substitutional elements. And that's because you get a pronounced lattice distortion, which is not isotropic. Hmm? And um, you, ca you get an elliptical uh, shape, strain ellipsoid uh, type of deformation of the lattice. But again, here, um, a wide variety of reported values going as low as 2,263 here up to uh, 5,544 for carbon and uh, about the same type of range for nitrogen. This, the strengthening values of boron does not does appears to be a big effect, but there's not much reliable data. And the reason is because, again, the concentration levels of boron that uh, you can use to do these tests are rather limited. Hmm? But it appears to have a big, big effect. Again, we'll never use this effect because you never add a percent of boron to a steel. Um, it doesn't have enough uh, solubility. Hmm? Anyway, again, uh, what's the approach? Uh, well, line them up and, and take the median value. Uh, and that's very close to 5,000 
megapascal per percent for uh, carbon and, and nitrogen in both cases. So very high uh, hardening here. Now, you may ask a question. Uh, is it possible that um, atoms, solutes, instead of increasing the strength, reduce the strength? After all, why not? Hmm? Um, and it's particularly the case for ferritic steels. Yes? So if we look at uh, temperatures around room temperature, yes, and higher, yes, we can think of the so room temperature and higher. Uh, we can think of dislocations as interacting with atoms, yes, that exert a, a force on the dislocation, yeah, and, then if, and if you apply enough uh, stress on the dislocation, the, the dislocation can pull away from this solute. However, there's something, remember, very special about ferrite and ferritic steels. And certainly at lower temperatures, we know that the properties are very dependent on uh, the way the dislocations move. And the dislocations tend to, to have this kind of shape with very long screw dislocations. And you know that these screw dislocations they move by a process called kink pair formation, yes, yes. And then once the kink pairs are formed, the propagation, lateral propagation of these kink pairs uh, to, or to the left and to the right. Yeah. It turns out that Certain alloying elements, in fact, many alloying elements, yes, will facilitate, makes kink pair formation easier. Now, if you make the formation of kink pairs easier, you're not hardening the material at all. You're actually softening it, yes. And so if you look at the increase of the yield strength of a particular element, for instance, silicon or manganese, yes, and you plot this as a function of the temperature, yes, you see that around room temperature, yes, you do get a high increase in the strength, but when you drop the temperature, it goes from a strengthening effect to a softening effect. Yes? You also see that as you increase the temperature, this, it, it doesn't, the, inc the, the strengthening effect is less. The reason why that is, that is because your modulus, yes, your shear modulus, your elastic modulus, decreases with temperature. Yes, and the strengthening effect is, of course, is, is also related to uh, the stiffness. And as your stiffness, the lattice stiffness is reduced, you get, at higher temperature, you get less hardening. So very important here. Uh, so if you look at the uh, yield strength, yes, as a function of temperature for iron, we know that it, it goes very it goes up steeply below room temperature. Hmm. So this would be pure iron, pure iron. Hmm. Now say I add silicon to pure iron. Well, at room temperature, the steel is stronger. 
I get strengthening. Yeah? So, and also at higher temperature, but at lower temperature, not. Right? So, here, the alloyed variant, the alloyed uh, iron, is softer than um, the unalloyed. So, you get softening effect. And, and the explanation is, well, you know, it facilitates the presence of the alloying element facilitate the double kink formation process. Right, so a rather important thing to know uh, when, when, you, when you're thinking about uh, low temperature applications. Of course, uh, when, when you have an application where, where both, you know, where, where your, your temperature range will be from plus 40 to minus 60, as many applications are, you know, obviously you, you, know, you will have to uh, do a room temperature strengthening and then you will have to live with whatever softening an alloying element may give you at lower temperatures. All right. Okay. Uh, I have uh, five minutes, so let's let's just um, introduce um, the topic of strengthening with uh, strain hardening. So that's very simple. Uh, when you add dislocations, dislocation, dislocation interactions give rise to pinning. And uh, you remember um, last week or, or before that, uh, we, we introduced a, a very efficient uh, uh, pinning point for dislocations, and that's when you have two dislocations cross each other, yes, and you form a sessile jog, yes, sessile jog. Which, which is a very strong pinning point because it's a little piece of dislocation that can basically not move because it got a glide plane, it's on a plane, yes? So it has to move on this glide plane, but its Burgers factor is, is not in that glide plane. So the Burgers factor tells it in what direction it can move, it can shear, right? So it, it can only move in this direction, but it's, it's lying in this plane, so it's pretty much caught uh, and, and it's very strong pinning point. So, um, obviously, the more I make intersections on the dislocations, the stronger that dislocation will be uh, um, uh, pinned. And um, if, you, if you look at the stress, yes, and if by some method or, or another, um, you can use X-ray diffraction methods uh, to determine the dislocation density, or you can use direct observation by in transmission electron microscopy, just measure the dislocation density, and you plot the flow stress, or the stress as a function of the dislocation density, the square root of it, you find a nice linear relationship. Hmm? A nice linear relationship. The, um, if you analyze this, However, it's also an important thing to know this. Uh, this dislocation density um, uh, doesn't mask something that happens to the dislocation density. As you um, deform the material, you just do not add dislocations. What, what also happens is you very often developed patterns, dislocation patterns. Mm -hmm. And so, which means that you have areas in your crystal with very high dislocation densities yeah, and areas with very low dislocation densities, yes? And we call this a cell structure. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you look at this 
this location density in more detail. So as you strain, yes, you measure, now it's, this is dislocation density as a function of strain. You, you of course see an increase in the dislocation density. And when you analyze, yes, you see that most of your dislocations are in the cell walls, yes, and there is a small amount of dislocation in the cell interior, yes. But these are, the ones in the cell interiors are the only ones that are mobile, yes. The mo they're the mobile dislocations. Huh? So they, they will cross, they will cross the dislocation. The dislocation will cross from one dislocation cell wall to another one and then be trapped into the dislocation uh, cell walls. Huh? Okay, so that's important for you to realize that the dislocation density, uh, uh, that you get patterning, dislocation patterning. Huh? But even then, uh, the relation between the, the strengthening effect from dislocation, dislocation interaction from strain, so strain hardening is proportional to the dislocation, the strain hardening is proportional to the dislocation density square root of it. This is an example of patterning which I already uh, introduced in the past. And so the important thing, uh, uh, this, this interaction between dislocation, we call this uh, forest dislocation hardening. Mm -hmm. So our dislocation on its gl glide plane encounters dislocations which are on an other glide plane. Mm -hmm. And for instance, you generate a sessile jog, which acts as a very strong um, uh, obstacle. Hmm? So these obstacles here that the dislocation encounters, you have now to think of it as a forest. And instead of trees, you have dislocation lines, yeah? a forest of dislocation lines. And your um, the dislocation that passes here is pinned by the other dislocations. Yes. Now it's important. Please uh, remember that it's not because dislocations cut each other that you always form a sessile jog, right? You not always form sessile jogs. It's sometimes you do. Sometimes you don't. It depends on the Burgess factors, uh, the glide planes, etc. Hmm? So. Uh, these obstacles will have a certain uh, retaining force, yes, which may be large or small depending on the case. Yeah? And uh, yes, and the, the, the distance between the uh, two dislocations, if you have a square pattern, yeah, you have a nice geometric square pattern, is given by one over the square root of the dislocation density. And that's where, that's the root of this, the reason why you have the strain, the strengthening uh, that is proportional to the square root of the dislocation density. Okay, we think I'll um, close, this is a good point to, to close, and uh, let's close here. And uh, we will um, then meet uh, next uh, Monday morning.